Thanks very much. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, talk about why uh, why I think uh, having a technology trust and in particular our technology trust uh, makes sense. Uh, so I was going to talk about some of the the global uh, influences on technology that make us quite enthusiastic about technology as a secular theme and uh, in particular uh, what's going on right now. So if I if I, I I'm going to skip some of the slides which you'll get about the team process and how we select portfolios and just go to some of the uh, the big ideas or big trends that are happening in technology. Uh, the first one of these is, you know, as as we've seen over the last uh, decade, uh, you've created tremendous value as the consumer has moved to the internet for shopping and for information uh, with Google and Facebook and Amazon and Apple. You know, many of these now at over a trillion dollars in value. And we think that over the next 10 years, uh, one of the major drivers in technology is going to be this movement of enterprises from uh, their controlling their own uh, uh, bespoke uh, uh, enterprise uh, empires to moving to the cloud and to moving to uh, a more uh, adoption of uh, software as a service. And so, what I show in this slide is uh, that about 10% of the infrastructure of the world has moved to the cloud, uh, still a long way to go. And we think uh, it'll be at least 50% by 2030. Um, and uh, eventually m most of the infrastructure of the world will be running on the cloud. And uh, you know, many companies uh, initially were doing this for cost reasons, but I think during the pandemic, they found that the flexibility of being in the cloud and the ability for, for employees or customers to uh, access information from anywhere uh, made uh, their old infrastructure uh, you know, very difficult to operate and access. And so that, that what we've seen this year is many of those big projects of transformation, what, what co companies are calling digital transformation were postponed uh, during the uh, pandemic. And, uh, starting in early this year that people started signing those or reaffirming those large digital projects. And, you know, these are projects, you know, a typical project for a large company would be a half a billion dollars. And, uh, you know, it would start small, uh, you know, maybe $50 million the first year and then double in size the second year as they start to move their their data over into the cloud. And then the third year when they do their processing and their data in the cloud, it would be, it would double again. So you have this, this great tailwind, I think, for the technology sector. And, you know, this isn't just something that's static. Uh, you know, once you've, once you've moved your data and your, uh, your processing into the cloud, then you can begin to uh, apply uh, AI, you know, uh, to this data. And so, you know, once your Salesforce management system, for example, is in the cloud, you can start to look at, uh, and all, all the detail about your customers, you can start to look at uh, developing a, uh, you know, a to-do list for every salesman based on the probability of, of uh, a, a deal closing or a customer buying new software or a customer upgrading. And uh, you can basically use all of the information that you've gotten from your customers over time um, that shows you the, the best prospects to be calling on that day. Uh, once you have your data from your factory in the cloud, you can use the information from your best operators to figure out how to, how to operate each of your plants as well as the best plant is operating. Uh, you know, you change the feedstock, you change the raw material, uh, you know, how do you adjust that quickly and, and maximize your yield? And so, uh, you know, those are just a couple examples uh, that uh, that I think are coming. And then uh, the other uh, the other point I wanted to make is this uh, tailwind that's coming from uh, labor shortages. Uh, I, you know, I was just in the UK last week and I was watching uh, in, in wonder the gas lines uh, on my way to the airport. And uh, you know, I think that this is indicative of uh, uh, labor shortages that we're going to be seeing for the next decade. 
uh, just simply because of the demographics uh, throughout the world, not just in uh, the UK, not just in the US, not just in Europe, uh, but also in places like China and, and obviously Japan's been uh, dealing with that issue for, for quite a while. So, uh, you know, this is simply a fa function of the fact that there are fewer people coming into the labor force, uh, more people are retiring than entering, and therefore uh, you have this uh, shortage that's building up of labor. And uh, during these periods in the past, uh, uh, and, and, you know, this is something that's going to last at least 10 years. You know, this shows 30, 30 years in this slide, but I, I, you know, I think at least the next 10 years, you can't do anything about it until the uh, births start to increase. And uh, this slide just shows that you, it's a tremendous tailwind to technology adoption and, and technology usage when uh, you have this labor shortage. Uh, you know, the idea of, of using robots, of using automation, of uh, you know, if we, you know, I think the pandemic has also played into this using QR codes to to order at a restaurant instead of uh, you know dealing with the shortage of waitresses and and servers. Uh, uh, you know, maybe using robots to even cook. Uh, we're starting to see that uh, in in some restaurants. So uh, the point is that the adoption of technology has a nice tailwind for the next ten years uh, that I think is very important powerful. And then, uh, you know, an additional factor that I don't have a slide for is uh, just the idea of, uh, and, and this is uh, one of the themes, this shows some of the themes in the portfolio, uh, this fourth bullet point about uh, electrification of vehicles. And, uh, you know, clearly climate change is uh, growing in importance and growing in severity. And so, uh, you know, I think the idea of uh, transitioning the transportation sector to clean energy, uh, primarily using uh, electric vehicles um, and uh, also more efficient vehicles using AI and uh, automated driving capability. I mean, you're, you're seeing this tremendous uh, transition in the in the transportation sector that is is happening, and I think that. You know, initially we're just getting to the point where vehicles are getting comparable in functionality and comparable in price. Uh, electric vehicles continue to decline in price, and internal combustion vehicles continue to go up in price as um, their engines and emissions are more constrained. And so, you know, I think that at some point in the near future, you're going to see uh, governments kind of flip the switch and put in penalties and um, additional charges uh, to, to accelerate this transition um, because uh, it's an easy way to reduce the, the carbon load on the atmosphere by about 25 to 30 percent simply by switching out the fleet. So, you know, why is that important to technology? I, I think that if you look at the, the, the semiconductor content of an electric vehicle versus an inter in, internal combustion vehicle, it's you know it's two to six times uh, the the previous vehicle depending on how recently it was developed, and so you have this uh, tremendous uh, demand and shortage right now, but you know tremendous secular demand for uh, technology to um, help make this transition. And and I would say the same thing applies to uh, use of solar energy and and semiconductor inverters to to help transition. Uh, the production of energy, uh, wind energy, the same idea. So uh, technology is uh, part of the solution for many of these uh, issues that uh, apply to um, climate change and uh, the world, you know, making the world a more, uh, a more friendly place as we go forward. Um, you know, an additional theme that is that is mentioned here is collaboration and work from anywhere. I think that, you know, you've, you've seen a change in people's view of work-life balance as a result of the pandemic and maybe, you know, some perspective on, on uh, work versus uh, their life uh, as a result of the pandemic. And so uh, managing uh, remote and on-premise employees uh, simultaneously requires new tools that uh, in involve technology. So, uh, you know, collaboration software, I think, is a new category that's arising in technology. Um, 
And then, you know, the, the second theme here is advertising. I think, again, advertising uh, being targeted through uh, search and through social media. And now you have connected TV uh, coming. And uh, again, those, are, those ads can be much more targeted to the person actually using that connected TV. So you're not showing a, you know, a, a, a car advertisement to somebody that just bought a car. You're not showing a, a you know, a insurance advertisement to somebody that, that doesn't have a car, that uses a bicycle uh, and so forth. So, you know, much more uh, uh, targeted and higher return advertising uh, than you've, you've had in the past. Um, talking a little bit about the, the, the structure of our portfolio, um, you know, obviously, uh, if you look at indices uh, throughout the world, you have these mega cap companies that are a large portion of the of the uh, index. And, you know, in the U.S., you have five companies that, that are over 50 percent of most ETFs. And um, here I show the Dow Jones, Dow Jones World Technology Index, 63 percent of the of the index in mega cap companies. Although there are hundreds of companies in the index, uh, you're actually, uh, you actually own very few companies <clears throat> in terms of their influence on your portfolio. So our attitude is, yeah, we, we like the mega cap companies, but we think in this environment, the large cap and mid cap companies uh, can grow much faster. Uh, they're less constrained by regulation and um, potential uh, handcuffs that companies are putting on these large companies. And, and uh, in the enterprise sector, uh, this transition that we're talking about, there are lots of companies that are going to be part of this new infrastructure that have uh, great annuity characteristics in their business as they get put in place for the next 20 or 30 years. Uh, they can improve their profitability and have very high uh, um, visibility associated with their outlook. Uh, because many of them have a subscription model uh, that they've developed. Uh, if you look at, uh, you know, this is just a, a listing of our top 10 companies, and you can see, yes, we own the Alphabets and the Microsofts and the Amazons and the Apples in that list of top 10. But we also have, uh, you know, cybersecurity companies that are important to this cloud transition, like CrowdStrike and Zscaler. We have AI companies like NVIDIA. Uh, we have uh, companies that are developing uh, uh, the software systems uh, for the world like EPAM. Uh, and we have some uh, hardware companies like uh, disk drive companies used to, to store data for AI and battery companies like Samsung SDI. So uh, a, a diverse portfolio and you can see that software is our, our largest allocation. We like the software sector for the reasons that I've mentioned about this enterprise transition. Semiconductors, uh, much better value. Uh, and uh, we think that that, that sector is in the process of being re-rated. And so uh, those are our, our two largest uh, exposures. You can see the, the weighting in the portfolio. I, I think the United States at 84% is a little deceiving because most of these companies um, are trying to get to over 50% outside of the US in terms of their business. But because their business models, uh, particularly in the software area, were uh, or have been focused on subscription and uh, you know, they, lose, they lose money as they build up that subscription base, um, many venture capitalists throughout the world, and in fact, many companies uh, that were thinking about getting into the cloud sector decided that they didn't want to take the large losses for the first five years. And so they weren't very interested in supporting these companies. Uh, this allowed the US companies and the more patient venture capital in the US to kind of build up a, uh, you know, a, a competitive advantage in the sense that, you know, they've got tens of thousands of customers uh, throughout the world at this point. And you know, their cash flow now makes them profitable. I mean, if you look at, for example, the, the cloud giants, uh, you know, it, it took Amazon, uh, you know, 10 years to get profitable with AWS. Microsoft uh, got there a few years ago. Google is still losing money, even though they're multi-billion dollars in the cloud. 
and many of the telcos that initially thought they'd get into the cloud infrastructure business said, I, we're not, we just can't take the billions of dollars of losses uh, for our shareholders, and so they got out of the business. And so uh, I think that's a, an example of where patient capital kind of uh, won out. Um, now, I, I, another, another issue that people talk about is tech valuations. And I think what, we, what, what we've seen over the last 10 years is tech valuations and, and the valuations of the market were very similar. That started to diverge uh, during the period around the pandemic as uh, the stability of the new tech models uh, started to get recognized with somewhat higher valuations. But you know, I, I, and, I, and I think that those are justified. That, that premium is justified, but it, it's it's not a huge premium relative to history. You know, before uh, 2007, for example, if you look at the premium, it was much larger. Um, and I think that uh, in, in some sense, the high growth of these companies uh, during this period of time and, and over the next several years uh, allows them to have high growth in revenues and earnings and uh, lesser growth in their stock prices and kind of grow into their higher valuations. So we feel, we feel comfortable with valuations and uh, you know, our house view is uh, uh, long-term interest rates will not go spiking back up to four or five percent that they're going to be lower for longer and that uh, helps uh, the growth portion of our portfolio uh, but you know i would mention that uh, uh, the the uh, portfolio also has a large component of uh, of uh, value stocks primarily in the semiconductor area but also in some of the manufacturing areas where I think valuations are much more reasonable. Uh, in this chart, the GARP um, valuation companies are represented by the large cap companies. Generally, they're growing less than 20% a year uh, and, and their valuations are reasonable. Um, and the high growth areas uh, generally represented by these high growth software companies and a few high growth internet and security companies. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think in summary, we feel that uh, technology is, uh, has been and will continue to be a great uh, area to be invested in. I think having, uh, you know, maybe just talking a little bit about the team, uh, we have a team of, of 10 people in San Francisco, uh, five of them run uh, a large AI fund, uh, global AI fund, and uh, the five of us uh, run uh, this technology trust. And uh, you know we're very focused on uh, building the portfolio up uh, stock by stock, uh, and so uh, very much fundamental analysts uh, who try to get to know our companies well. And I I, I think our we have the advantage I think of being in um, an area where you know technology development continues to be at a high rate and. Um, you know, basically being on the ground in a place where uh, you know many of these companies are developing or down the street from us, I, I, I think that has a, a great uh, competitive advantage for us relative to other managers. So I think I'm gonna uh, just finish with that. Uh, uh, oh, uh, performance has been great too, um, as you you can imagine, with uh, somebody focused on the, a high growth area of. Uh, of the market. Um, you can see this is a this is a slide that shows our uh, the, the portfolio and you'll notice that uh, earnings growth over the next 12 months in our portfolio 26 percent uh, benchmark 8.2 that that's because we're entering a period where I think uh, you're, you're through the comparisons with the the weak COVID period and you're into more difficult comparisons going forward uh, as the economy slows down in 2022. Um, we, you pay a little bit more for the, uh, in our portfolio for the high growth, uh, but you get much higher growth uh, than the benchmark and the, and the market. And if you look at it on a PEG ratio, you know, the multiple that you're paying for the growth that you're getting we're actually less than the benchmark and less than the, the, mark, uh, the technology market. So our, our focus is on, on uh, 
high earnings growth companies. Sometimes those can be inexpensive companies like semiconductors, or sometimes it can be uh, high growth, uh, high growth companies, high growth software companies. So um, in summary, I think this is a great time to be a technology investor and uh, uh, we have tremendous tailwinds in this sector, and I think it should be part of uh, any growth investor's portfolio. 